thousands of Malians protest against President Ibrahim Keita. Palestinians in the occupied Gaza Strip mark Naksa Day. And the Vice President of Zimbabwe's Movement for Democratic Change Alliance detained as battle for the control of the opposition movement deeds. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South. Thousands of people have demonstrated in Mali demanding the resignation of President Ibrahim Keita for allegedly failing to end attacks by armed groups in the country's northern region. The demonstrators also denounce corruption and arbitrary detentions, which they say have increased under Keita's administration. They also demanded the release of opposition leader Suma Lassis, who was kidnapped while campaigning for the April legislative elections. Kenya on Friday banned the use of plastics such as water bottles and straws from its national parks, beaches, for forests and other protected areas as part of efforts to curb a pollution. Tourists visiting these sites as well as hotels and lodges located in these areas will no longer be allowed to use items such as bottles, straws, cutlery, plates, cups and cotton buds made of plastic. Police in Zimbabwe have arrested the vice president of the Movement for Democratic Change Alliance, Tendai Biti. Biti and five other party officials were arrested in the capital, Harare, after they attempted to force their way into the party headquarters, which is currently occupied by a rival faction of the opposition party. The party has been divided since the country's Supreme Court ruled that party president Nelson, Nelson Chamisa was not its, legislative, uh, its legitimate leader and installed Tokosani Kupe, head of one faction inside the party, to lead it in the interview. In the world, what government in the world interferes, interferes in the affairs of a private voluntary organization. And you, you send the army, you send the army. The National Union of Journalists of Cameroon has called for an investigation into the death of a prominent journalist. Samuel Wasisi died in military detention earlier this week, 10 months after he was arrested for criticizing the government's handling of the political crisis in the country's anglophone region. We have special demands. We demand that the government tell us the place of his death, the day of his death, the circumstances of his death and that the body be handed over to us or to his family. So these are the points that have been put forward, and we are waiting a little while to be able to undertake other measures. On Friday, South Africa's ruling party, the African National Congress, or ANC, launched an anti-racism campaign in solidarity with protests in the United States over the death of George Floyd. The Black Friday campaign will call on South Africans to wear black every Friday for an as yet unspecified period of time. This will serve to highlight the continued prevalence of racism and police brutality in the world. A statement by the party described racism as a blit of the soul of the world. The National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, NUMSA, has claimed victory in a COVID-19 related labor matter after the country's labor court dismissed an application launched by a steel manufacturers to stop workers from striking during the COVID-19 pandemic. Workers at Max Steel Group have been on strike since May 28th after management cut their salaries by 20% citing financial difficulties caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Max Steel had approached the labor court to interdict the strike. We are vindicated by this court judgment. It found in our favor. It found that the decision taken by Max Steel Management to cut salaries for the months of May, June and July by 20% was indeed a, um, a change in the terms of, and conditions. It found that Max Steel Management did not consult and this was, was a unilateral decision. And therefore, on the basis of this, the strike that our members have embarked on is a legal strike. It is a protected strike. It is a lawful strike. The United Nations has expressed concern at the increase in the number of attacks on civilians by armed groups in the Democratic Republic of Congo. UN Human Rights High Commissioner said some of the attacks may amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity.
I call on the authorities to do their utmost to introduce or expand the presence of security forces in the areas of conflict to ensure they protect civilians rather than prey on them. Protection of civilians is the responsibility of the state. And when the state leaves a vacuum, it puts these communities at great risk. In the RC, past experience shows this can have catastrophic results. Some of these attacks and killings of civilians in the eastern provinces may amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. I was appalled by the atrocities I heard firsthand from these civilians in the camp of Bunia. Children, mothers brutally attacked, wounded, maimed, and killed. These people are being chased from their homes, fleeing the armed groups, and receiving no protection from the military and police forces who have also committed grave violations. Forces loyal to Libya's internationally recognized government captured the last major stronghold of renegade General Khalifa Haftar near Tripoli on Friday, keeping the sudden collapse of his 14-month offensive on the capital. According to military sources, Haftar's forces have been forced to withdraw from the town of Tarhuna following days of clashes with government of National Accord troops. The advance by GNA forces has reversed many of Haftar's gains from last year when he launched the offensive to wrestle control of Tripoli from the GNA. I am sending a message to the countries who support the aggression and who help kill Libyans and destroy the country, telling them that your bid has failed and we will sue you after you have tasted defeat at the doors of Tripoli. We will always stay loyal to the blood of our martyrs and the sacrifice of our heroes. Hence our decision not to sit on the table with a war criminal because he has never been a partner in the political process or the peace process. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a minute. Welcome back to From the South. More news now. Ecuador's Ministry of Defense has approved an agreement that would allow the armed forces to use lethal force against protesters. The Ombudsman Office has since requested the repeal of the proposal, saying it violates human rights. Let's have a look. Ministerial Agreement 179 has entered the nation's official registry. The agreement would allow the Ecuadorian armed forces to progressively use lethal force against the people. Trying to control internal activities when you are not prepared to, it provokes a distortion on the role of the armed forces and violates human rights, mainly to people's lives, and would break restrictions on cruel and degrading treatment. Part of the agreement indicates that the armed forces may use force to repress gatherings, demonstrations, protests, and situations of internal violence that could result in serious calamities. It cannot be that when Ecuadorian workers protest, they are repressed. Neoliberalism wants to silence workers, and we already said we won't accept it. This is an evidence of the government's inability to solve economic and sanitary issues the country is facing. The scale to determine the appropriate use of force is classified in five levels, allowing, as a last option, the use of firearms with little ammunition to allegedly neutralize violent situations. If you take a gun and shoot it at a civilian, that's a murder. The progressive use of weapons is for the police, not for those who are trained for war. The police is the one that has specific crowd control tools like tear gas. In addition, the police also have all the necessary protective equipment. This ministerial agreement is coming out mere months after the popular uprising of October 2019, considered to be the most important in recent years in Ecuador. It also shows the popular rejection against the last economic measures as further mobilizations are already being planned. In Mexico, hundreds of people took to the streets of Jalisco to demand justice for the killing of Giovanni Lopez. Lopez was a construction worker who died after being violently arrested by police forces in the municipality of Ixtrahuacan for not using a face mask amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Protesters demand that the errant policemen be brought to justice. 
Brazil's death toll from the novel coronavirus has surged past 34,000 to become the third highest in the world, surpassing Italy's. Our correspondent, Brian Muir, has more. For the second night in a row, the Brazilian federal government announced record numbers of deaths from coronavirus. And for the second night in a row, it withheld this information from the public until after the most popular nightly news program, Jornal Nacional, had terminated. The most troubling thing about these numbers is that for the first time since the pandemic began, the state of Rio de Janeiro surpassed Sao Paulo in terms of total number of deaths. Now, this is troubling for several reasons. First of all, because the state only has about 34% of the population of Sao Paulo. The state of Rio de Janeiro demographically is dominated by the capital, the city of Rio, which has about 85% of the state's population living in it. And it's an area with incredibly dense residential areas. Other troubling factors about Rio de Janeiro include the fact that the state has been bankrupt since after the Olympics. It's a state where the public health system has never been very good. And it's a state where far-right Governor Wilson Witzel was recently accused by the federal police of embezzling money from the field hospitals that were built to deal with the pandemic. And as there's no sign that the curve is gonna be flattened in the near future, in Rio or Sao Paulo, both governors have announced that they're gonna start reopening commerce right now. Argentina's government has extended the coronavirus lockdown until June 28th in the regions worst affected by the pandemic, including the capital, Buenos Aires, and its metropolitan area. We are going to extend this by 21 days, so we are going to meet again on June 28. Protesters took the streets of New York to mark Breonna Taylor's birthday at Black Lives Matter rally. In March, the 26-year-old medical worker was shot dead in her own apartment in Louisville, Kentucky by police who barged in alleging her home had been used by drug dealers. Today, Taylor would have turned 27 years old. Protesters there also demanded justice for the killing of George Floyd, who was killed by security forces in Minneapolis. In Palestine, citizens in Gaza held a sit-in to show their support for George Floyd with some children kneeling while holding a portrait of the black man who died after a policeman knelt on his neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds in Minneapolis. This sit-in is in solidarity with the people of the world, especially with the American people currently persecuted by racial oppression. All of us, as Palestinians, stand today here to say not to racial discrimination, not to oppression, that we are all free and we do not distinguish between race and color. This is a solidarity sit in by the people of Rafah on behalf of the Palestinian people who express a rejection of American and Israeli racism. The killing of George Floyd is not the first and not the last. And here in Rafah, we have had Rachel Corey killed. Still in the Gaza Strip, Palestinians on Friday rallied to mark 53 years of Israeli occupation and protests against the Jewish state's plans to annex part of the territory. Dozens of demonstrators waved Palestinian flags and chanted slogans against Israeli settlements and the plans which could move ahead as early as next month. Protests also took place in the West Bank cities of Ramallah, Hebron and Nablus. We are here today to take a stand, wherein the Palestinian people embody a commitment to their inalienable rights on the memory of the 53rd Palestinian Nazca. The residents of Beit Hanun are here to assure that they are keen on returning to their homes. This march shows a rejection of any plan of settlement or annexation, and on the anniversary of the Nazca, we've been saying since 1967, this is our land and we will defend it, with all our power and energy. We call for this demonstration to reject the annexation plan, especially in the Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. In St. Kitts and Nevis, citizens have begun voting in general elections held amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Prime Minister Dr. Timothy Harris cast his ballot early as polls opened 
at 7 p.m. and are set to close at 6 p.m. local time. He is seeking a second term in office as his team Unity Party secured seven of the 11 seats in the 2015 elections. His main opponent, Dr. Denzel Douglas, hopes to reclaim leadership of the country. Dr. Douglas is the longest serving prime minister from 1995 to 2015. Meanwhile, more than 48,000 people have registered to vote in this year's elections. Amid concerns over the coronavirus crisis, political campaigns were held virtually. This included live stream concerts and speeches from party leaders and candidates. Although the rallies lacked the usual grandeur seen in years past with energetic party supporters, the stages were well set as politicians made a last ditch effort to sway voters. One voter representing the Diabetes Association has said that while the voting process appeared to be smooth, he hopes provisions have been made for those who suffer from the non-communicable disease. I got here about 15 minutes ago and I realized that large quantities of people are here to vote. You know, as usual, wearing my hat as the PRO of the Diabetes Association, my concern would always be the waiting time for some of the diabetics, especially those who are insulin dependent and who could be subject to significant fluctuations in their blood sugar levels. Based upon the, the duration of their wait here, based upon the bright sunshine that would have its own impact. And so that would be my concern. Obviously, those are factors that I would hope people would have borne in mind when they would have been coming around and hopefully would have prepared adequately for that. Earlier, we were joined by political analyst and regional pollster Peter Wickham, who believes that Prime Minister Dr. Timothy Harris has a real chance of retaining victory. Normally in the Caribbean, we assume that a, a reasonable government, a decent government, gets two terms. Uh, so I always say that the second term is about proving that the government was really that bad and should not deserve a second term, because there are a few governments in the region that have not gained a second term. Against that background, uh, Dr. Douglas's victory would mean that Dr. Harris would not get a second term, uh, and you no know, one could argue that he has a chance, uh, as, as any other politician would have a chance going in. But the, the history of the region, and certainly in St. Kitts, is such that uh, governments, generally speaking, only get, uh, would normally get at least two terms and thereafter be removed, if, if, if necessary. St. Lucia has recorded one new imported case of the novel coronavirus after more than a month with zero active cases. This takes the total number of positives on the island to 19. 18 people have already recovered. Of 23 tests conducted, there was one positive case of COVID-19. The individual is a 33-year-old female who is one of our nationals working on the cruise line. She was recently repatriated to St. Lucia and was placed in institutional quarantine as per national protocol. In keeping with the testing strategy for repatriated cruise line workers, she was swabbed to determine her COVID-19 status. Upon receiving the results confirming this case, the individual has now been placed in isolation for care and is doing well. The United States has reportedly threatened to withhold military assistance to Antigua and Barbuda over an unpaid loan. The Prime Minister made the declaration during Parliament on Tuesday. I asked the distinguished ambassador, you know, how do you expect us to pay that $25 million dollar, um, outstanding um, debt in terms of the arrears at a time when we can't even pay salaries and wages? And I said, not because we don't want to pay. <laughs> but we just don't have the resources. And the irony about it too is that they owe us for the WTO debt. And even though we ask them to do a set off against what they owe us, they are not looking at us. In fact, you know what they've done? During this time of COVID, the ambassador said to me, well, the US will withdraw all support, all military support that they give to the Antigua and Barbie Defense Force. These are the challenges that we have to deal with as a small nation. And then the very ambassador will ask me why we're so close to China. <laughs> now, I don't know if they want us to be self-sacrificing allies to take, and let's say, a hostile position against China, and then to literally eliminate that source of support. China has been the most supportive government to the people and gov the government of people of Antigua and Barbuda for years.
And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesorenglish.net. And be sure to follow us on social media as well. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and of course, on Instagram. For Telesor English, I am Stefania Bravo. Until next time.